Whoa, feedback. <clears throat> okay, this is the voiceover for the opener of the voiceover radio show. This is take one. In a world where laughter was king. Uh, no in a world, buddy. What do you mean, no in a world? Um, it's a podcast. Oh? Okay. In a land that... No in a land either. In a time... No, I don't think so. In a land before time... It's two guys talking about voiceovers. When everything you know is wrong. That's wrong. A girl. No. Two girls. Well, maybe Andrew, but come on. Now, no. more than Stop it. a renegade cop. A cop? A robot renegade cop. You're fired. You're fired. No, you're actually fired. I'm fired. Get out of the booth, Jack. No, I like it in here. There's no take two. There's no just a little more purple. Warts and all, you've downloaded the VO Radio Show. And welcome to another episode of the VO Radio Show. This is episode four, and uh, my name is Andrew Peters, and up in Sydney is... Is Robbo. How are you going, mate? I'm very well. How's your week been? Very busy, actually. Thank you, and you? Yeah, it's been good. No complaints. Now, today we've uh, got an interview with a guy who, if you live in LA and you're in the business, you will know very well. His name is Mark Grau. And Mark has a studio set up in Burbank. It's a beautiful studio too. Um, Say not just a studio. No, yeah, not not a just a studio. A studio. Yeah, that's not a studio. This is a studio. That's right. Yes. Uh, he's done studios. Yeah, he's done very well. He's uh, a guy that came out of radio and uh, doing a lot of character voices. Uh, Learned the art of working the desk. And uh, evolved into being a studio owner, not only a talent, but also um, a, an engineer, producer, and studio owner. It's interesting, isn't it? Because there's a few Australian guys I know, of, I know of who have gone the other way, who have started off as engineers and turned out as voiceover artists. Paul Pidioni. Yep. Uh, Sideshow Mike. Yep. Another one. So, um, so well, yeah, side- very talented people. Yeah, Sidey's still doing his thing. Uh, as far yes, as engineering, he hasn't stuff, slipped yeah. out from behind the desk. Side is still, yeah, multitasking. But, yes, um, yeah. But it's, it is funny because now that you could have probably answer this question, um, if you're uh, trained as an audio engineer, mm. and then you step onto the other side of the glass, what are you actually hearing? I uh, look. I can only speak for myself, uh, and I guess I approached I, when I was trying to put demos together and deciding whether it was something I wanted to do. Uh, I approached scripts the way I would direct them, I guess. So I sort of, I would read through the script. Okay, if I was directing someone else, how would they get them to read this? And that's, that's, that's how I would approach it. Yeah, but it's, it, it's interesting because I think it, there's, there's a couple of different uh, people in the industry. There's the, you know, the promo read, that kind of stuff. And then there's the actor who comes in and does a performance. Yep. And my question really is, to, can someone who comes from a background of being an audio engineer then get to a position of being to putting in an actor's performance into a script? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I guess. I, 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 I can't think of anyone off the top of my yet, he, head yet who has, and I in no way mean any disrespect to Saidi or Paul, um, the two guys we've already mentioned in that way. They're both very good voiceover artists, but yep. maybe Saidi in, in acting and Paul to a certain extent. But if you were, yeah, you would certainly, you would maybe cast outside of those two if you were looking more for more of a pure acting role. Yes, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. what I'm trying to get get at is the, the headspace, you, you know, because you're so trained in a certain aspect of, uh, levels, how the, how it sounds, mm. like the actual sound, mm. not not the the read, mm. not the delivery. Mm. That mm. you're going to get distracted while you're trying to read the script. Yeah, I think the acting thing is more of the skill, though, isn't it? Yeah, you know, the acting thing is the real skill of the of the you know the all round voice artist. But talking about the performance, I, I've also I was saw a, a, a thread, a forum the other day, and someone posed the question, which I've seen so many times: Should I wear headphones or not? Yeah. And uh, that's, yeah. you know, to me, it's like, well, yes, you should, but because, you know, there, there's obviously technical things. If you're not working with an engineer, you're sitting at home, you've got to, mm-hmm. you know, you've got to hear stuff because you could be, yep. could be sounding disgusting at the other end, you know, that's with right. pops and clicks and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but does that affect the performance? Do you actually then start to focus on 
what you're hearing as opposed to what you're actually saying. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, see, that would be my question to you because when I do the very rare voiceover here, I actually have one ear on, one ear off. Oh, okay. For that exact reason. Because I like to hear myself as is, but I also am listening for pops and dropouts and, and all that sort of stuff. So that would be my question to you. What is the best way to – well, what's your preferred way to work? I always work with headphones, but I think that's maybe because of the radio background that you kind of get used mm-hmm. to – you know, it's it's about the mic technique, and uh, and I and I also think as an actor because I did rem- there was a comment that uh, Nick Tate made made in the interview we did with him about being an actor, and he said, look, there's a lot of actors out there that looked fantastic or had a fantastic voice, but they were so busy concentrating on looking fantastic or sounding good that their performance mm-hmm. suffered. So yeah. maybe that's the argument for not wearing headphones. I don't know. I'll try it and see. And in fact, maybe it's a good experiment. Get one script, read it with headphones and read it without and just listen to the difference. Yeah. Look, I know a good mate of mine, Ella James, who's a, a female voiceover artist who was a female vo- voiceover artist here in Sydney, has moved to LA to, um, to pursue her dreams of becoming a comedy, stand-up comedy artist. But to pay the rent while she's over there, she started doing voiceovers. And she was telling me the other day, she's been surprised how many studios she's walked into in LA and she's expected to voice without headphones. And she's finding that difficult. So, um, wow. So horses, horses, maybe, yeah. That's, maybe there's some people who prefer it. Yeah, that's really strange. I, I, because the other thing, you know, well, maybe they've just got like talk back through monitors in the, in the booth. They must do, yeah. They would, I would think so. Yeah. But, um, hey, wait, we've got a huge audience. Uh, around the world with the, the, the VO radio show. Maybe someone might like to set us straight, jump onto the, um, the website, voradioshow.com, and, um, and uh, give us a bit of an insight into what's happening in your studio with headphones and voiceover artists and stuff. Yeah, because, look, it is one of those threads. Whenever I see it, it gets a lot of activity. Mm. Everybody's got an opinion about, you know, the, the, the th- common things are, should I wear headphones or not? What microphone and preamp should I have, which we talked about last week, you know? Yeah. Um, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we'll see. I, hopefully, people do actually let us know what what they prefer, whether they prefer headphones or not headphones. Which I'd is it? Yeah, and also engineers. Yeah, do you prefer your voiceover artist to work without headphones? I, you know, what? Uh, like maybe, maybe, um, maybe it's just me, but I would prefer they wore headphones. Only, only on the proviso they actually understood how a microphone worked. Um, yeah. Because you know, you know, it's like if you're recording someone and they're moving their head all over the joint. Yes, <laughs> and that happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, at least if you've got headphones, you can hear your level dropping, hopefully, and you you know get yourself back in in the right position. Right. Yeah, down the barrel. Yeah. The VO Radio Show is produced in the studios of Voodoo Sound Radio <laughs> TV. <laughs> Find it all at voodoo-sound.com. Talking about, uh, interesting talking about the old days because I, I've been flicking back through my, um, my uh, collection of promos and stuff from over the years and I came across one uh, from a guy that you, both you and I have worked with and a lot of people out there will know, a guy by the name of Jeff Thomas. Yep. Who, uh, who I was lucky enough to work with in the early days of my career and who probably taught me most of what I still put into practice with my promo work today. Yeah. Um, but it, I was just listening through a few promos and it, it, sparked, a, uh, it sparked a bit of an, a thought for something we could chat about on the show this week and maybe I should preface all this by, um, by playing this promo. It's one of Tomo's uh, from back in the early 90s. It's for Guns N' Roses concert in Sydney. So um, let's just have a listen to that. Saturday, January 30, as the sun sets on Eastern Creek, FM 105 sets the night on fire. The world's hottest rock act, Guns N' Roses. Coca-Cola present Guns N' Roses live in the only venue big enough, Eastern Creek. January 30. Tickets go on sale Monday for Use Your Illusion, the concert. The Gunners, live at the Creek for Coca-Cola, Frontier and Triple M. So Tomo's now since moved on, uh... Uh, he did work for a long time for uh, for Rick Dees and Howard Stern. Yep. 
uh, over in the States. He also re-imaged Capital Radio in London uh, yep. there for a while. And these days um, he does his, his work out of a little studio down in Narrabeen. Which is for, the and yeah, the, 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 the beaches of Sydney. <laughs> Last, well, I'll tell you a funny story. Last time I rang for a chat, I spoke to his receptionist and was told that it was lunchtime and he was across the road at the beach having a swim. So, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Things are obviously going all right for Tomo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, he's living the dream. Good work. He's living the dream. But I worked with Tomo as well back in the... back Sorry. in the. I worked with Tomo as well back in the um, yes. late 80s when we worked together. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's, like, he's amazing. And yeah. he, his company now with, you know, Kilohertz, and he's got a new company as well uh, where That's he does right. a lot of... Easily one of the top... For those of you who don't know him, easily one of the top five imaging producers in the world, by yeah. far, hands down. So um, nice to see that there's an Aussie doing some good work like that. We should try and get him on the show. We should. I, I, I will put in that call and see what we can do. I did speak to him, and he... he <laughs> He was, he was a bit cagey, so uh, we'll see if we can convince him that uh, he'd get on the show. I'll take him down a couple of beers and sit him down and have a chat. Go and sit on the beach. Have a fish and chips right, and a few beers. Right, go and sit on the beach with some fish and chips. That's more his style these days, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, so the reason I, I, I bring up that Gunners promo is not because it's awesome production. I mean, it's, you know, it's good um, and all that sort of stuff. But I, I wanted to talk more about feel um, and, and, and emotion uh, in promos and in general on, on the radio. Um, something that I know that you and I have discussed off air a few times, Andrew. Yeah. Um, I just, I, 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 I played that promo because I like the way script, production and voice all work together to give the whole thing a feel. Yeah. It's not just a concert promo that says, you know, um, uh, Guns N' Roses are playing at Eastern Creek Saturday night. Mate, get your tickets from Ticket Tech. Make sure you're there. It actually sets up at some emotion and it actually makes me feel a certain way, especially those opening lines sort of setting the scene of, you know, Eastern Creek as the sun goes down, sort of a bit of anticipation um, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And, and I'm not saying that it doesn't happen in radio, but I'm saying that it's something that sometimes gets lost. Um, and, and it's also something that, you know, people coming through have probably not had a chance to sort of figure out for themselves yet is we all try, we all spend a lot of time trying to make people laugh um, and all that sort of stuff on radio, which is great, but there's also a lot of other emotions that we can play with to sort of catch people's attention. Yeah, I think those um, kind, the kind of emotions... example. Yeah, well, the, those kind of emotions are far more difficult, difficult to, to get across. That's probably to why. Tap into, yes, you know, it's absolutely. just do a do a gag. You know, everyone, <laughs> that's really funny. But to actually, yeah. you know, f find your audience and build a story that's going to get them completely hooked. That that's it. That's yeah. an art. That's an absolute art. That's right. And 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 I guess the 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 the, the, the thing we're trying to get to here is whether it's a forty five second promo like that one, or whether it's um, a, a, a radio thon raising money for sick children across the day, we can still build emotion. Yeah. Um, you know, with what we do. And that's the sort, that's the, and, and for me, that is the magic of radio. Yeah. That, that without pictures, you can still capture someone's emotion. I, 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 I always remember um, one of my mentors, a guy called Phil Douse, who was my program director at Triple M for a while. And we, we were doing... It was raising money for a sick child and, and no disrespect to the family, but I can't remember the name of the child or what. It was a cancer or something like that. And we were doing a marathon across the day and I was doing a wrap-up promo. And I said to Phil, I said, you know, what do you think we want to do with this? And he said, just make them cry. And, and we did this 45, 60-second piece wrapping up all these callers from across the day and all that sort of stuff. And I think we used um, Eric Clapton's Tears in Heaven underneath. Um, we started with the letter that came in in the morning to the breakfast show, um, summing up what went on. Then we put in a couple of, you know, emotional callers from across the day. Um, and, th and that actually won us an award. I can't remember what the award was. It was one of the Australian Radio Awards for, for promos. Um, but... It was one of those promos too that you listened to it and the hair stood up on the back of your neck. Yeah. And it sort of, you know what, it made you want to, it almost made you feel like crying. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and, and I think, I, I don't think that's gone from Australian radio, don't get me wrong, but I think it's, it's slowly dying for me, um, that art of not just being able to make people laugh, but stirring a whole range of emotions. Yeah. It, look, at, like I said, it is, that is uh, you know, an absolute art form to be able to create something like that. And uh, and it doesn't actually need a script either. I mean, as in the classic, you know, a script for someone to read. You can do it mm. just by, you know, gathering material, which you obviously did with that promo. Mm. Um, mm. You know, and it's, the, it's the, the, the classic thing of a, a commercial. It's the story arc, you know. Having said that, I have done a few promos of late, and they have been uh, for uh, the Triple M Radio Network in, in Australia. Um mm. And we did, you know, a rock and roll one. I mean, it's easy with ACDC. You can do stuff with that because, you know, it's, mm. you've got such a history. Everyone, you hear that chord or whatever, guitar riff, and you're immediately mm. locked in. But yeah. I, I did a, a TV promo, um, and it, it was actually for, it was for the Channel News Asia in Singapore. And one of the producers yeah. sent me a script and said, look, I just want to do this as a pitch to my boss. Um, do you mind reading it? I went, yeah, sure. So we did a few takes and... Uh, he he put it together and showed his boss, and it went to air. They loved it, and and it was actually it's a really clever promo. Um, mm. It's got very little script, but the the little parts of script just set the emotion and set yeah. to to the pictures. And it's all about Singapore yeah. at turning fifty. It's fifty years of independence, and yeah. um, and, and and it really works. It's got a it's got a really really nice story to it it's got a great arc and it mm. it sets up the emotion of of the of the, the the story he's portraying yeah but i mean how much easier is it for you as a voiceover artist or as an actor to to set the scene when the script does some of the work for you oh you know, absolutely it's so much more difficult isn't it yeah how many yeah, times okay. you, you can always like you don't even have to look at the script and dissect it to work out if it's a good script mm. but immediately you start reading it you find out if it's a good script or not. If yeah. it ju- if it just works straight away, you just it, you know you know it's a really it's well written. If you're struggling yeah. with parts of the script and you can't really work out why you're struggling, it's because it's mm. probably not well written. Or yeah. you ha- or you've been on a bender the night before and you you cross eyed. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the trick too for for um especially for radio guys out there, engineers who write their own scripts is you know sort of finish your script, put it down, walk away from it for a while and then come back to it and pick it up and as if you're a voiceover artist and you're about to walk into the booth and read it. Yeah. And, and for me, nine times out of ten, there's at least one or two lines that I'll take out because I'll just go, well, I, so either it's unnecessary or it's doing the complete opposite to what I need it to do. Yeah. But see, that's a luxury too now because uh, these days everyone's time poor. You know, you just don't have the, you literally do not have the time to... to put into those kind no. of promos. No. But having said that too, once you've got, you know, if you don't have the time to walk away, even once you've got voiceover in the booth, first l- listen or two through will tell you, hang on, something's not quite working here. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, just flick a flute, few lines out or, you know, let's just try one this way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you remember the days. Like, I, I, I bet it doesn't happen anymore. Not that I'm privy to it because I don't work in radio stations uh, and, and sit with engineers building promos. But... You know, I remember some of those promos. Admittedly, we were using, you know, vinyl and onto tape, two-inch tape. Yes, yes. But, you know, they were marathon sessions to get a really crack promo oh. together. And these guys, you know, it's not their fault. They just don't have that time anymore. No. Although, you know, the, the digital age has certainly made things a lot faster. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, me working here in the studio, I've got, Jesus, I think there's 130,000 songs or something sitting on a hard drive. Yeah. Um, that just, you know, I can just go to and drag in. Um, whereas in the old days, you'd walk down to the CD library or the record library and you'd, you'd have to go through the catalogue to find, you know, what CDs you were looking for or records you were looking for and then go to the library and drag them out and take them back and sit through and have a listen to them. Whereas now you just, you know, throw them in Pro Tools and skip through them and find the bits you want. So yeah, how much I, time is that saving even by itself? Well, I remember the days of there's a guy here that you would know called Nigel Haynes. Yep, and uh, back in the early '80s, when he was he used to fly in and out of radio stations, building promos for them. And uh, I remember him sitting there with a stack of vinyl, and he was so f- I've never seen anyone that fast. He was actually running two turntables, two or three turntables, and just ripping stuff from one turntable to another, and doing this yeah. like almost like a live mix. 
It was yep. it was quite incredible, and he would build these yep. unbelievable promos. Yep. See, I know Tomo um, on some of his more difficult edits back in the tape days would actually just put it down to quarter inch and make physical cuts uh, so if he actually yeah. had to. Yep. Lovely. On the more difficult edits and stuff like that, rather than trying to drop or you know, yeah, slide it in on the next track. Yeah. So yeah, it's all about precision, and that's why those guys are so good at what they do because um, you know they find a way to make make it perfect. Yep. So, um, so, well, yeah, and and one thing I must say, Tomo's very good at is emotion, even still today, getting emotion into his stuff. Yeah, because he, he cried when I spoke to him on the phone. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. He's always crying. He girl. is. He is with joy. <laughs> Going yeah. bald like me too, can I proudly say. So, you know, there's one thing we've got in common. Ah, uh, lovely. You've got to love a moonroof on your head. Indeed. That's yeah. right. Bit of sun in. Yeah. We, uh, we should probably get on with this week's episode. I think we probably should. In a world. In a world where only the best voice will do. Realtimecasting.com. No, I've got to do a warning before we get into this that uh, this is definitely, uh, well, it's, it's adults only. Um, yeah, I started beeping him out and then went, you know what, screw this. <laughs> <laughs> there is some uh, pretty full-on language in here, so if you're offended by language, it's, go away and come back next week. Radio language. Behind yeah. the scenes radio language. <laughs> it is, indeed. Um, so if you if you do get offended, you know, obviously, don't push on with this podcast. But if you're not yeah. easily offended by language and you're really interested in this guy, which I'm sure you would be, check it out because yeah. the, this guy's got some amazing stories. His name is Mark Grau. Uh, anyone in LA, as I mentioned before, would know exactly who he is. But uh, as I mentioned before, he's a talent, studio owner, and uh, a really funny guy. The voice for the voices. This is the VO Radio Show. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon or good morning to you, I guess. It huh? is good morning for me, indeed. I don't know whether it's a good morning, but it definitely is a morning. Well, you said you did a couple of auditions. That's always a good morning. No, they were paid <laughs> ones. I, I, we don't audition in Australia. That's even better. We're here. We don't actually ever work. We just audition. That's right. <laughs> Whenever you look at the industry, you, you've got the ex-radio guys and then you've got the actors. How did you get involved? In voiceover. I kind of grew up, my dad used to anchor news at a TV station, and I was actually born in Hollywood, if that's not strange and cliche. Um, so I kind of grew up around the TV atmosphere, although he was, you know, extraordinarily conservative, obviously, being a news guy. I mean, if you got pot, you know, caught smoking pot at 12 years old, it was like, oh, my God, you're going to hell. Don't tell me. I know what you're doing, you communist, you know. Um, so... Um, <laughs> I, the first thing I, I actually started, I mean, I was in radio, but, but my first love was always the production end of stuff. Years and years and years ago, I kind of BSed my way um, back up to Hollywood. I could, did the you know circuitous route all through Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Oregon, Washington, San Diego, San Francisco, doing radio and realized, you know, I really like something that's a little more stable. So um, when I came back, back up here, I was working at a large music studio called Cherokee Recording. And... I really had no idea what I was doing in that respect at all. But they hired me to um, run their media studio. They were trying to start a, you know, like radio TV, you know, that kind of stuff um, in Studio 5. And so I basically, you know, took that over and hit it off with with a lot of, you know, very, very good contacts and stuff. And that was kind of that first foray into the, the biz up here. Actually, I ended up buying the studio from them um, and talked them into selling it to me on time because I had no money at all. And I was living in just an awful, awful place in East Hollywood behind a Yugoslavian landlord. Yeah. And uh, it, things went well enough there that moved into a little space in Hollywood. Um, it was about, oh, I don't know, 650 square feet, 600 feet, something like that. And so it went well, then doubled in size there, then tripled in size there. They, the neighborhood there was getting a little rough, and that's, that's when it moved out, took the studio out to Burbank. Yeah. Um, and the VO thing, um, I had locked up with an agent, Don Pitts who was really at, at that point back when, I think, you know, Bob Bergen was, oh goodness, maybe 15 years old and doing Muppet Babies. And Don was like the quintessential voiceover agent. I remember sitting in, in his office and watching Orson Welles go in and Gary Owens and Casey Kasem. And, you know, I mean, he's really heavyweight. Mel Blanc, I mean, he represented everybody. He still represents like June Foray. And, you know, so that was that was many, many years ago. And then, I, you know, I got an audition at, at Hanna-Barbera. I'd, I'd done a lot of voice work, but I'd never actually auditioned for anything. 
So it was kind of a strange process. I, I wasn't really certain how that worked. So I went and I, I think they, you know, thought I was on crack because I was like, now we'll have to find the great note of stuff. You may call me great, great. Yes. You know, it was like, God, what's the matter with him? Yeah. You know, not realizing that I didn't need to jump around quite that quickly. Um, and things just kind of took off from that point. You know, you were talking about the acting chops, and really, even if you're doing commercial stuff, you still and you've you've found that even with a radio background, the announcer stuff is great, but when they want you to tone it down and sound natural, that can be a struggle for somebody that's done radio. <clears throat> you know, because immediately you're you know it's like red light. Hey, how you doing? You know, and it's that kind of you know. No, no, no. We want that to be natural. It is natural. The old traditional disc jockey is pretty well gone now. It's all um, sports sports people and comedians. It really is. Well, the talk radio thing is huge. And at this point, it, I think the formats are more like, what kind of reaction can we get? Yeah. You know, especially, I think Howard Stern really opened the door for that with how far can you push it? Yeah. You know, as far as terrestrial radio and just push it right up to the limit, maybe a little bit over and see what happens. And it's it's become a, a very commercialized commodity now. I mean, I'm, you know, everything is nice. Obviously, they're trying to make money. But I don't know. You know, some some of the formats... I think people put too much in surveys, so it's all, you know, the arbitron. Well, we've gone up a point with, you know, men 18 to 25. Well, we've gone down a point. So everything is based on that, and that's how they structure their format rather than, you know, people really like that song. Yeah, but it's not in the top 10. You know, it's not in radio records. It's not in Billboard, you know. Yeah. It's very interesting, um, even from the aspect of, of having a studio, hiring engineers, it's like, listen to it. It's like, yeah, but look at the way. No, don't look at it. And I've had guys, you know, I'd say, just shut shut it off. Turn the screen off so you're not looking at the waveform. Just listen to what you're doing. You're missing like about a quarter of a downbeat. Yeah. You know, like on an, on an edit. And they're just not, they're looking, you know, and they'll blow it up great big. And, de- you know, and it's so everything is done by sight rather than, you know, having that that feeling I mean, that sounds like I should like smoke pot and live in Orange County in a TV. Um, you know, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Well, yeah, I don't mean it. You know, it just. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a feeling you get when when it's mixed right and it's not, and it's you're just going, holy shit, this is incredible. Nowadays, you know, with all the technology, I mean, you can take somebody who really has minimal talent and you can throw them in there, and if they've and if they've got computer expertise, they can sound incredible. A guy we interviewed a couple of weeks back is a friend of mine who's uh, an English guy, ex recording engineer, and he teaches kids now in audio and one of the things he does is takes them away from pro tools and puts them on a two inch tape machine that's and great it, and it freaks them out oh i'm sure because they've got no visual cue they don't know what's going on well the interesting thing is it is coming up through those rounds it was stuff like the, the the first big commercial that i had was van halen's first album and it was all you know cutting on a half inch machine 30 ips um, which is blistering fast. Yeah. Um, you know, the mix, of course, was done on a two inch 24 inch. So, but you've got, you know, Warner Brothers was there and the band was there and, I, you know, the room was just crammed. And when you're making an edit, you know, you've got little pieces taped all over the place that are marked as to what was that again? Yeah. Cause you don't have that luxury. Well, you're all just draw it back out. Yeah. You know, it's like if, if you cut it, it's permanent unless you cut it back in. At that point, was there was all these neat tricks that you had to learn because the technology wasn't there to do it. I remember um, recording once uh, Frankenstein for the the CBS Mystery Theater, and the guys that were producing it, you know, got into a big argument. Well, I, I don't concur, Bill. I don't think that's what Mary Shelley had in mind. You know, so they ended up with this monster that sounded like, you know, a, a very effeminate Wally Cox. He was just like, I swear, I just grr. I just hate all the villagers. You know, <laughs> it was like, well, that's. That's going to do well. So just like things like slowing it down and then throwing it all uh, backwards, you know, playing it backwards, writing echo to another machine. Well, now when you flip that full track over, the echo is on it, but instead of on the end of it dissipating, it comes in. So it's that, you know, kind of thing on, and that will make the hair on your neck stand up. Yeah, yeah. And just little things like that, we just... Because there was no other way to do it at that point. No, you've got Waves plugins. $99 this weekend only. Okay. Yeah. Do, do you use more, mainly outboard for your studio? Um, well, it's you know what's funny? We use outboard gear for recording. Um, we've got a stack of 10 limiters in each room, you know, compressor limiters that we use. And actually, we still use a lot of um, the old Aphex ones. We even use DBX 160s because they're really good and fast. The problem with a lot of digital digital stuff, we've got the, all the wave stuff that you use, you know, as far as plugins after the fact. But when you're recording, we, like when we were doing a Timon and Puma, and, and all of a sudden he's, you know, Timon, you know, it, you need to, you can't just have a, you know, yeah. you need to be able to keep that. 
Um, and we found that, that these old analog compressors are just dynamite. They're very fast, very transparent, and they just grab stuff real, real quickly. And at, at that level of recording, I mean, the kind of stuff we're doing, you can't, you know, tell William Shatner, um, well, that overmodulated, could you do that again? It's <laughs> not going to go over real well. <laughs> no, that's there true. certainly are upsides to it. You know, it's wonderful. It's like now, you know, where we used to have, you know, huge videotape machines and all kinds of stuff for doing film and TV. And, you know, now everything is on a quick time. Yeah. I can I remember a couple of stories like having center track time code um, analog. And we were doing a project for TV Teddy. Um, the thing wouldn't lock it because what the, this wonderful guy, instead of putting continuous time code, he just put it in pieces you know, on each section that he wanted, which means that every time everything hit the space in between, all the machines go insane trying to find the, the time code. So they're going backwards and forwards and, you know, fast forward, fast rewind. Everything's just spinning all over the place. Yeah. So it was a, a you know one, a really tough session. And about two weeks before that, we had done a session with Milton Burrow, who is a very, very, well, he's not alive anymore, but he was an extraordinarily mean-spirited foul mouth. I mean, beyond belief. Um, and so... What I ended up doing was taking the Milton Berle outtakes and cut it on, and, you know, burned it onto the chip. So here's this adorable little white fuzzy bear going, you know, fucking cocksucker, you can't get tiny. <laughs> Which was uh, pretty tasteless, but it was very funny. I think one of my favorites, we had Charlton Heston. He used to feel very comfortable, so he would actually come over and sit in his robe and slippers in the kitchen and read the paper, which is very odd. You know, why? I, I have no idea what people would walk out and go, is, is that, you know, it's like, yeah, he just feels comfortable. But this out, he was doing one of his biblical CD-ROMs, and he has his coffee sitting there, and he goes, and God looked down and said, and he knocked his coffee over, and he goes, fuck, oh, shit. You know, I was like, well, thank you, Moses. I don't know what book God said that in, but thank you. <laughs> now, because you've spent a lot of time and a lot of money um, with your studio, how do you feel about the home studio? Um, I think they're great. I'm actually, I have a home studio. It's in all honesty, it's a double-edged sword. It's to be careful what you wish for. Um, it's good because it's opened up a much wider spectrum of talent. The downside, I think, is just the fact that anybody can, you know, buy a USB mic, throw it in their computer, and they're doing voice work. Mm -hmm. And there's a little more to it than that. And also, at a certain level, like, you know, having a home studio here, it's it's wonderful. I mean, I've got a, a whisper room and, you know, all of that wonderful stuff and, you know, Pro Tools, HD, and blah, blah, blah. Um, the downside is that that you find yourself, you know, working at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, you know, at night because they want stuff in New York by, you know, 5 a.m., 6 a.m. Well, that's the thing about the industry now, though. It's, it, lots of time on your hands, but you've got no freedom. You're always on call. Well, it's true. I just went on a, a big trip to eight countries in 17 days in Europe and had my rig right there in my case with me. And every, you know, go to a hotel, first thing you do is everything comes out all set up and you're you're ready to roll, you know. Yeah. And it's nice. I mean, it's, it's great to, to be able to do that. You know, there's some guys, um, Wally Winger, a good bud. Wally was the uh, announcer on the Jay Leno show. And when he was doing Leno, he couldn't leave town, you know, period for fear of somebody else coming in and, you know, taking your gig kind of a thing. And so, you know, a lot of people do, don't go far simply because of that reason. They're concerned about, you know, they need to be close to, to be able to do their stuff. Yeah. The other thing about home studio, and I remember the first guys that I ever saw have them, uh, and they were usually network guys that had been set up with ISDN. So it was it was a luxury for the, for the big guys and the big girls in the business. But, of course, now technology allows lots of people to, you know, have a home studio. Do you think that's actually seriously affecting the quality of the business? Um, I, I think it's changed the business model immensely. I mean, it used to be a very select group of people that would have to actually go out. And there's also the social aspect. You know, you would run into people at the voice caster or at Deke or at Hanna-Barbera or at your agent's office where, you know, 99% of auditions now are home, you know, um, and even jobs. So you don't really have that social connection. And I think sometimes you, you do become very isolated. That, and I, th I think, too, you, and you have an awful lot of people throwing their hat into the ring that sometimes aren't aware of the rules that you're playing by. There's some site like the, the I don't know if you're familiar with the website, Fiverr. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Well, that's everybody's nightmare. It's like, are you kidding me? You're going to do a voiceover for five bucks? It's like, is your ego so bruised, really? I mean, you know, you'd never make a living off of that ever, not in a million years. 
Um, so what, what's the point in doing that? And, and so I think a lot of the time people assume, you know, oh, yeah, well, I, you know, or there's a lot of pay to play sites. Now, there are people that claim they make a lot of money on that. God bless them if they do. That's great. The majority of people that I've talked to, you know, they, they, again, that's what an agent's job is, is an agent's your front line. They're the guys that are in the trenches and they're not getting paid an issue unless you do. So a thousand, a thousand plus 10, you know, they're going to bust their butt to get 2000. So you're, you know, you're getting 2000 and they're getting 200. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about online soon, but I just want to cover a couple of other things before we do sure. just sticking on the home studio thing, uh, because you've got, got guys on the Fiverr, as you mentioned before, that would affect the amount of money they spend on the setup of their home studio, which in turn would also affect the way the thing sounds. Well, sure. I mean, you can, you can get by, you know, for, with auditioning, you know, for certain things and, and that's fine, but there's a lot of people that, you know, I will have them send me auditions and they're just atrocious. It's like, well, it doesn't matter how good your read is. If it's, you know, you know, it's all over modulated or it's very, very low. You don't understand that, you know, a client is playing those back and yours isn't is either very low or extraordinarily high and not in the same ballpark as everyone else's. They're not even going to bother to listen to it. You yeah. know, it's just it'll, it'll go. So the, the downside to a home studio is that it forces you to not only be talent, but also an engineer. So you need to know your way around a little bit. And I've had people that go, oh, well, I don't know a thing about computers. And it's like, well, you better learn. This is not a good situation for you to, to be in. Yeah. And the thing is, too, that a lot of the time, because you're at home, you don't have an outside reference point. So you're going, wow, this sounds great. And in the real world, it sounds terrible. Yeah. You know, it's it's not even it's not even close. So it's I think it's great that it's it has opened the field to a lot of people and and. You know, people that normally, like here in the States, in the Midwest, that would never have the opportunity to really get out and, and do much of anything. I mean, at least it gives them certainly a chance to to try and participate, and in some cases to participate, you know, and, and, and do stuff. I think, though, that in a lot of cases, like, you run into a lot of people that like, well, I'm, I'm just going to kind of dabble in that thing or, or do it part time. And it's like, well, it really doesn't work that way. Yeah. As you can attest to, I mean, if, if you're, you know moderately successful doing this it's not you know i look i have people that go oh my god if you've got this studio and you're doing all this voice stuff and it's like well yes and the studio has been there for 32 years you know and i'm an old guy and i've been doing this forever so it didn't yeah. it didn't just all of a sudden go here you want to do this it's you know i mean it, it does definitely take work what would you um, believe would be the most important piece of equipment for your home studio well the, i mean if you're talking about equipment the, the two major things are microphone and mic pre that's yeah. the, that's because that's the top of your chain, and that's that's the stuff that's really going to. Well, it doesn't really matter digital workstation. I mean, if you're using a you know cheapy free version of Audacity, if you're using Pro Tools HD, if you're using Twisted Wave Adobe, that it, it's. I mean, that really comes down to comfort level and whatever works for you. And the interesting thing is with microphones, you know, too, the, the reason at the studio we've got a, a mic room that's got a bazillion mics in it is because depending on the voice. You know, like personally, I love using a 416, yeah. you know, for, for everything I do. Now, you know, right now I'm using a, just a, a Neumann, basically, just specifically just for Skype. You know? yeah. But, it, it, you know, again, it, it's not that you sound bad. It's just that there's certain, like a 416 might be too bright and sibilant for a woman's voice. Yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of mics out there and you really need to test them. I, I wouldn't, with a microphone, I would never just go by someone's, oh, yeah, I use this. Oh, then that's what I'm going to get. It's like, no, go if there's even like a local here in the States, a guitar center. They will let you try out mics, you know, and plug them in and see what you sound like. See, see what you're happy with. Um, I've had people that go, well, I'm run to, you know, I'm using a Pro Tools HD. I brought body uh, Focusrite Red Series mic pre. Um, I'm using a Neumann 170. Um, I'm, you know, and it's like, well, that's wonderful. You know, you've got, you know, and a, a FireWire board and a, and they bought a Whisper Room. And it's like people go, well, I should get ISDN. No, you shouldn't. If there's a call for it. And you have clients going, I, we need this, well, then, then it's time to, you know, invest or look at that. But even things like Source Connect and, you know, IDPTL, all of that, it, it's like wait until you have someone requesting you to use that. Yeah. You know, otherwise, you, it's just another piece of equipment, another program that's just going to sit there. We've actually got 10 lines into each studio. And the reason for that is that a lot of sessions are multiple. Now, people say, well, ISDN is going by the wayside, and it's not. I would give it 7 to 10, possibly. 
because it's still very, very sturdy. There's no dropouts. All of the other stuff is all based on bandwidth. Yeah. So if you have, you know, your your little home, you know, and the bandwidth is bad, then you start get a, a, that got you know that kind of and especially if you're trying to lock to video it just you're you're all over the place yeah um now we still do you know we'll use source connect we even use skype you know where they can look in and see why we're recording you know a different source but isdn is still a very very solid format for us there's no dropouts you know everything is right there and if you're at that level when i mean we just finished a, a movie to london and the director was ron howard who was on the line on the other side <laughs> that's not the kind of person you want to have any issues at all I mean, you know, zero. You want that session to run absolutely seamlessly. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I won't be working with them again. It's true. I remember, you know, going way back, um, it was in the middle of a big Warner Brothers session and the earthquake happened. And uh, they were just, you know, so it was like, act of God. Yeah, fuck them. Where's our demo? We are, you know, where, where, where's yeah. the tape? We need, you know, they just don't care. And so we have a, a lot of redundancy as well. I mean, you've got a computer saying, so if something's from, boom, here's another one, plug it in, let's go. Yep. You know? There's the same thing, ISDN, you, all of that kind of stuff, microphones, mic pre, everything. So if there's an issue, you can pull something from a room, put it in, you know, so there are no no problems like that. But the, the biggest factor, too, is to is to use something that you understand, that you that you work well with and you you know what the parameters are. One of the, the crazy things now is is audio books. Now, there are, you know, some guys that are very, very good at that. Scotty Brick is amazing at it and has made, you know, a lot of money. It's probably at the top of the heap for that. Most people, though, don't realize that, you know, with situations like ACX and that kind of thing, it's the percentage of sales and all that kind of which is very much like record company accounting. Um, the other thing is, too, is that what people miss is it's like, we'll give you $2,000 to do an audiobook, and you're going, two grand for a job. Wow, that's great. But they want a finished, completely edited, cleaned up, mastered version delivered to them. And unless you are an exceptional editor and know what you're doing, you're going to realize very quickly you're making about $1.50 an hour. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the, and the thing is, I think what, one of the things that people miss in this business is that it is a business. Do I love it? Absolutely, positively. It's paid for two divorces. It's put three kids through college. You know, it's, it's I mean, I've, I've lived a, a very, very well. I live a very good life. But it is a business. With agents and that kind of thing, when people go, well, because it's so creative. And it's like, no, it's not if you go to an agent an agent wants to how much money are you bringing in here that's what they care about because that's what their job is you know so and i think some people miss that is it is it fun absolutely positively you know i'd much rather be doing this it's all that i've ever done i've, I've never done anything else but at the same point it is definitely a business and i always tell people approach it if you were opening a, a brick and mortar business you know saying okay you don't just order your business cards and go okay here i am you really need to go, okay, now what can I do to generate some clients? How can I get those clients to return to me? How do you think it's changed in the last 30 years? I mean, do you see uh, the people in the industry are different? Do they act differently? Are they are they less patient now? I think that the last 30, I mean, it's been immense, especially with the internet. I mean, it's opened up the, the world to stuff um, with all the, you know, again, the pay to plays and all the people that have, you know, a, a modicum of home studio. It's like, you know, a USB mic, plug it in your computer, I have a studio. There are a lot of people that really believe that, which is, you know, starting out, that's fine for auditioning and that kind of stuff. I think people are, you know, scrambling a little bit more, you know, like you'll hear people go, well, you know, celebrities do all the animation work. And that's not true. You know, it's the same thing with video games. There's a ton of that out there. You know, now it may not be the main lead. There's still a lot of work out there, both TV and, and you know, radio and film. And the beautiful part of this business is that regardless of what happens to the country's economy, you're still going to be working because that part never goes away. You know, you're still going to have plenty of commercials trying to sell stuff and plenty of TV, you know, programming content and video games, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Every machine, every device, the one thing they will always have is a human voice because people like to connect with another human. And that's that's the part, too. That's very interesting that you would bring that up because we very, very much lost a sense of that. And now there's a whole generation coming up that their idea of, of you know, interacting with someone is Internet. Yeah. You know, and so, and the terrible thing is, like, rather than sitting and talking like we are now, we're just talking and there it is. Whatever comes out, that's how it is. Internet wise, anytime you're doing stuff, it's now here, and you'll go back and you edit what you're doing and you'll do this and you'll do that, you know. And it's so very, very immediate 
but there's not really that human contact, which is really what you need. And that's one of the things I tell people even in, in teaching is that even doing voiceovers, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You need to connect on a human emotional level with that audience. You know, it's no different than if a little girl's sitting on the curb and she's crying. Well, you don't walk by, you know, most of the time, no, you're going to, you know, stop and you're going to get down to her level and your facial expression will change, your voice quality. And, well, sweetheart, are you okay? And, uh, and she looks at you, your eyes look at her eye, and you've, now you've made that, that connection. And a lot of the time, I think that's what people miss with stuff because it's not a matter of just going in and go, okay, here, I'm reading the copy. Now it's great. It's you need to have that connection. Yeah, I, I know what you're getting at this when you're working remotely. It's very difficult, especially well, when that's you're why we with... tell people to, to do two takes, especially yeah. on an audition, because half the time at this point in the process, they don't really know what they want. They think they do. And they'll give you a lot of very strange references and, and you know, sometimes cross direction. And, and I had a friend who sent me a piece of, of copy and the direction must have been three quarters of a page how we want this guy to be a guy next door. We do not want an announcer. We don't want an actor. He needs to be very genuine and very real. We want somebody like William H. Macy, but it has to have like Jim Carrey's comedy timing, but a vocal quality like Sam Elliott or James Earl it's like what <laughs> yeah. who are we talking to now Sybil I mean it's it's like they're having a psychotic episode and it goes on and on and on and on and the copy was Hillshire Farm Sausage is on sale this week for two ninety nine. that's it yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like really and sometimes our job is to keep a straight face and go oh yes oh yes I see that now yeah. But even when you're dealing, because now, because you're dealing a lot, as you said, with Japan and South Korea and Finland and various other countries, even the UK, because uh, I know there are words that we say here that are completely different to the way you would pronounce them there. And you, you even you even mentioned, you know, standing in a queue. People here would go, what the hell are you talking about? Here you're standing in a line. Ah, You know, and it's the same and it's the same kind of a thing. The first time somebody had said that to me in England, I was like, what? What do we, you know, I'm, I'm you know, audio guy. It's like, what are we queuing? What? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, the interesting thing with that is when you get scripts, you know, like scripts, let's say, um, in fact, <laughs> I used to do the, the liners for Radio One in Lebanon, and it would be that tonight, live from Radio One at the Fanacha <laughs> yeah. And it's, don't worry, my friend, it's pronounced, you know, it's like, what? Yes. So he'd send me an MP3 and it's like I'd have the engineer slowing it down to go. That's why now you are for to getting it. Why you should be. Yes. Like we've done a couple of things. We did one in Arabic and it was like, I'm sorry, you'll have to be here while this is edited. But, you know, the interesting thing is in, in all of this is that from a voiceover talents aspect, the key is is to be able to take direction. And the guys that, that are very successful in this be, can do that and change things rapidly. I always tell people, if you really feel you need to take a quote unquote voiceover class, take an improv class so that you have that ability to switch up because it's a very, very fast paced, quick business. Um, I was doing playing, I've used this before. I was playing a car, uh, at Cartoon Network, a troll. And she goes, she goes, I love the size of them. That's great. Now make it sweatier. You know, and you want to go, sweaty, what the hell does that mean? But you do that actor face thing and go, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Then what happens when you do it again? Now, hopefully, they'll go, yes, like that, but that, and they'll actually give you direction that makes sense. But that really is the key is to, is to whatever that person on the other side of the glass is telling you to do or on the other side of an ISDN line, a Skype session, you know, whatever it may be, it's you having that ability to interpret what it is they want and turn that into a, to a, a, a presentation for them. And sometimes the direction is nuts and won't, you know, you're, you're really kind of wondering, like, what the hell does that mean? Sometimes it's, it's really, really good. I've used this thing before with a, 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 a street rat. And it's like, so if you're going to do a street rat voice, the first thing everybody does is that Joe Pesci thing where all of a sudden he's doing is, hey, hey, what are you doing with my cheese? You know what I mean? And all of a sudden a guy's tough like this. Somebody walks out and goes, no, you know what? You need to put about 60 pounds on a guy and make him bigger. So now let's bring him down a little bit, put a little more girth on a guy. You know what I mean? So now, you know, he's got some weight to him. Somebody goes, he's stupid. So now, now, now you want to ma ma make him like not not that smart. Somebody goes, boss rat, bring him down an octave like this. You take my cheese, I'm pulling your tail out of the socket. Do we understand? Good. Then you go into the booth and they go, great, but don't do the accent. And you go, <laughs> yes. What? Don't, I'm a thespian. Don't you know what I'm bringing to this role? How dare you? You know, yeah. and, and you and you do. You'll have brain freeze. It's like. I, uh, do you find it difficult to, like you said before, now get rid of the accent when you're playing a character? Do you find that more difficult? Not really. I, I mean, at this point, you know, just because that's that's what your job is, is to go, oh, okay, great, and and be able to pull it back. 
you know, there's a, a thing that it, it's like if you do a character voice, if you can do that character voice in anything, reading a menu, reading, you know, a, an encyclopedia, you've mastered that character. So you can do anything, you know, the subtleties are, are going to just come to you immediately with that. A lot of people with character voice stuff, it will be based on like a little, you know, voice that they've done at a party, you know, like doing a, you know, a Bill Clinton impression, a, you know, that kind of a thing, which is fine. And it may be a very good impression for those two lines. But if you ask them to do something else or here, I need you to read, you know, these, you know, four graphs, they're all of a sudden going, uh, they're not used to doing that. They're used to just slipping in that, you know, it's like comfortable shoes. Yeah, I can rip this voice out and create and do it as long as they're saying this phrase. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's really the key is to just change on the spot. You know, I've had direction where she, you know, will go, you know, that's that's good. But what, put about 60 pounds on, give him a two martini lunch and let's add about three inches on his height. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to go, oh, OK, great. And, and do it. And they, and it's pretty amazing because you'll see the guys that are doing it. It's like it's a no brainer. They just go, oh, OK. And, yeah. and it's done, you know. But technology certainly has changed everything. And, you know, the internet has changed everything quite dramatically. And, and we talked about P2P sites. And I wanted to save this up because I think this is probably its own discussion. But the one thing that does concern me is that uh, the union is not able to react quickly enough to help the union members and, and the voice industry. The problem is, is that some of these people, and, and I played devil's advocate a number of times with this and go, but you guys, you're not living in the real world. You're living in an ivory tower here. I've got a lot of friends that are, you know, very well-known celebrities and they're going, no, but the union, and it's like, but you're, you're, you know, you're in rarefied air. When was the last time you worked for scale? So big difference. The dip, the thing with the pay to plays is now, like in your case, you're, you're someone who is in the business and understands what's going on and has a background in that. The interesting thing with the internet is that th there's no qualification. I mean, you can simply, you know, hey, I've got a website now that says, you know, Bob's casting. We've got the best voices in the world. The problem is that a lot of people, especially beginners, go, well, wow, Bob's casting signed me. And it's like, well, that's great, but that's not going to help you much, you know. And, and so from that aspect, there are some that are good. And that's why you people really need to do their homework to see, you know, what, what that's about. And I think that, honestly, once again, the whole business model is going that way. Everything is Internet-based. It's quick. Yep. It's effortless. But there are a lot of shady characters in it, just like there are in any business. I love it when people take all of these logos and put them up there, you know, and it's, you know, John's voiceover. And it's got all of these, huge, you know, McDonald's and Pepsi. And, De and it's like, really? You know, I was in a party situation with someone and they were talking about how they were the lead in this cartoon. And oh, yeah, yeah. And it was like, finally, I, I go, well, no, oh, yeah, no, I did that for you. And finally, I got him aside and went, you're full of shit because we recorded that at the studio. You weren't the lead. Well, I mean, I, I, I did a lot of the scratch tracks, but, you know, so I put a lot of celebrity pictures and, and stuff of the studio and blah, blah, blah. And the main reason for that is not the cocky, you know, hey, God, we're so cool. It's to legitimize what's going on to make people realize that it's not just a BS claim. I mean, how many, you know, how many emails do you get from so-and-so that's teaching classes now and it's somebody that you've never even heard of? And I always tell people, you know, find someone who really does this for a living that knows this business. That's not just somebody that, that you know, has done two things on, you know, voices.com or something. And now they're teaching a voiceover class. Mm. I mean, just, you know, find somebody that really knows what's going on. And I mean, there are people out there that are that are very good. But the difference is with the Internet, you can make really any claim you want. It's kind of the Wild West. You know, it it's is. no different yeah. than a, a dating site. And it's like, well, yes, I'm a six six, and I've got a twenty inch wazoo, and yeah. uh, I got my private jet, and I make a uh, ten million a year. You know, and then you see the guy, and he actually works at you know Walmart, making eight bucks an hour, and is driving an old Dodge. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know? The way the whole scale works can never ever be adapted to work online, and the, and the trouble well, is, everyone everyone shops online now. Everybody. So why is voiceover any different? Well, you see, that's just it. I think that sometimes they, they are a little isolated with the Hollywood, New York kind of thing. Union, you know, loves to pride themselves on all of the big guys, you know, the Tom Cruises and the Harrison Fords. And the, they're part of the union, yes, and they make millions and bazillions of dollars and the unions love to flaunt that. But for the little guy in the trenches, I always tell people it's, it's like doing a non-union job. Okay, you're forcing people to do that. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's because 
if the union was easy to deal with, then everything would be union. There'd be you no, know, my pre- pretense is, oh, my feeling was, you know, why don't you set a minimum of 500 bucks and the union gets 2%, agent gets 10% or whatever, and, every, and then you work out your own deal, whatever it is about that. And the same thing, 2%, 10%, and everybody's happy. Yeah. The problem is now that the union scares a lot of people, especially smaller clients, um, as far as the accounting, you know, things as far as, you know, based on points per market and where this is playing and residuals and all that can become crazy. It's wonderful as as a performer, but it can become really crazy trying to figure all of that out. Um, the other thing is, too, that, you know, people go global rule one. That's what it's called of Screen Actors Guild. Global rule one is that if you ever accept non-union work as a union member, we'll remove your left testicle and put it next to Danny Bonaducci's career on the mantle and all in perpetuity, you know, or something. <laughs> yeah. um, and But the reality is, I always tell people, you know, you would, no, you'll do non-union work. No, I wouldn't. The terrible thing is it's not a matter of of being anti-union. It simply is a matter of economics. I mean, years and years ago, I had a a company come up to me. They wanted me to do a a, a trailer for the movie Baron Munchausen. Well, it's a non-union bio. Well, would you do it for $15,000? It's like 15. Yeah, let me think about it. Hell yes. Let's see. (laughs) You know. $2 Two dollars in college, ex-wife. Oh yeah, hell yeah! I'll do you. Know, I'll do your on hold message too. It's like, you <laughs> exactly. Know, you know, and that's and it's just the reality. But what's interesting is there is a lot of very large clients that are doing non-union stuff that you would never, never think they were. But certain portions of them, certain divisions are non-union. And they, they pay well. It's just that it can be very, very difficult as a signatory sometimes to work with them. I had a, a, a project once as a signatory that was uh, four actors at double scale plus pension and welfare plus 10 percent to the agent, basically 26 weeks. So in essence, what they wanted me to do is rather than just being signatory across the board, I had to now become signatory for that project. And they wanted me to post a bond of virtually $300,000 to guarantee payment to the actors. Um, however, you can't use that money to pay the actors. That's just a guarantee after the project's done and you need to go back and fight with them to try and get the money back. And it's like, what, what do you think the client's going to do? Yep, let's go non-union. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's that easy. And I think if, if they were a little more in tune with what was going on, I don't think there would be any of that. I think, it'd be, I think everybody would be a member of the union and it would be great. They'd be happy. They would be making tons of money. Um, everybody would have wonderful control over what was going on. And I, I think it would work well. You know, OK, here's a great example in Los Angeles. This is for on camera. The SAG um, student agreement. So if you're a film student, let's say at USC or UCLA, well, it basically is the student agreement is no pay. <laughs> it's, wow. it's like, well, glad you went to bat on that one. You know, <laughs> I mean, and I, I understand, you know, a student film and that's great. But but, you know, no pay. I mean, come on, you got to at least do something here. And so there's a lot of things like that that are just interesting that, that kind of make people go, well, you know, hey, sure. You know, why not? I mean, I'll be curious to see how it all plays out. I think it'll change. It just it's going to have to at some point, you know, because you're right. I mean, that the whole online thing is, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it's, more people are using it. And the unions are missing out on what could potentially be a lot of money for them. Yeah, because I don't think they're realizing how big that is mm. and how and how big it's becoming. You know, I think they're kind of sitting, you know, resting on their laurels. And then all of a sudden in another five years, it's going to be like, oh, well, holy shit, look, look how big this industry is. And this is where it's all going. Yeah. You know, so I think at some point somebody's seriously going to have to sit down and figure out a way to deal with that. Absolutely. Mm. Well, there's lots of things we could talk about, but I just wanted to sort of, because well, I know you're busy and, and uh, got to get on with things. So I've got a, two, two questions. It's a two part, one question with two parts. And uh, it is basically, what do you miss? in the industry and what have you missed? What do I miss? Um, I think that, you know, for, for me, just that, that camaraderie of, of meeting people, you know, whether it be an audition or a job, you're actually going to specific places and see, you still get that when, when you're working, you know, just that fact where there, where there was a lot more communication, you'd see, run into a lot more people. <clears throat> the lucky part for me is having the studio. I still get that because people come through every day. So you at least get a chance to, you know, catch up a little bit, which is kind of nice. Um, what do I, and then what, do, what was the other, the second yeah, what, what have you missed? All the big jobs. They just went right by. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um, honestly, I don't really feel like I've, I've missed out on, on anything. I mean, the, everything has gone, you know, way above and beyond what I ever thought it would do. You know, again, I'm an, I'm an old guy and, and I mean, it's sustained me and, and 
you know, let me allowed me to live well and, you know, take care of kids and colleges and all that kind of stuff. So I, I don't feel like I've really missed out, you know, only because with the studio portion, too, we're kind of we have to be right smack in the middle of everything. And, you know, technology wise and what's going on and who's doing what and all of that kind of stuff. It's been an amazing ride, man. I, would, I wouldn't trade it in for, for anything. You know, once again, it is a business, but it, it's a phenomenal business. And I, I really I, I wouldn't trade, trade it for anything. And you also had the movie in a world shot at your studio. Yeah, Bill did a, a really, really great job on that. We had a ball, you know, doing it too. That the scene with uh, Mark Kelly and Joe Cipriano. Oh, um, yes. The, the, the funny thing is, is Fred Melamed that plays her dad is actually a very dear friend. So it was kind of odd going off. They actually cut a scene too, where I got very drunk in the movie um, and completely went off on him. You know, <laughs> just you know, kind of stumbled over, just which was kind of silly. So it was, but he's he's a very uh, affable guy. He's a great actor. He's been doing a lot of stuff. And it was it was fun. She and boy, that's a Cinderella story for her. Yeah, you know, she wrote it, um, directed it, produced it, starred in it, um, took it to Sundance, won the top writing prize. Sony picked it up, distributed it. Now she's doing a something. She's directing a very large project. I think the nice thing is with Bill is I I knew her actually before the movie because she'd come in and done some VO stuff. And the interesting thing was even like Fred Melamed, the played her dad. You know, people don't realize that, you know, he was the voice of CBS Sports for goodness forever back in the 80s, you know, uh, mid late 80s. Uh, you know, he's the voice of Boar's Head. You know, there was a definite, you know, reality to a lot of it as well. And the, and the fact of women not being used for that, you know, as much. But even that's making more and more inroads. You're hearing more women doing promos, you know, even doing movie trailers. I mean, it's, it's opening up definitely. It's been. Great to uh, talk to you, and um, I wish you all the best. And hopefully, next time I'm in there, I'll come check you out. I'd love to. I'd love to see your studio. It looks. It looks really cool. Oh, any time, man. It'd be my pleasure. I, thank you for having me, man. That was that was very sweet of you. Always a pleasure, and it's great to have you. The voice for the voices. This is the VO Radio Show. Well, that was Mark Grau, and uh, what an interesting guy he is, and he's living yes. my dream, as I mentioned in the interview. The, the, mm. I'd love to have a studio colourful. like that. Ah, oh. and a colourful character, indeed. <laughs> Very colourful. <laughs> and if you'd indeed the, the stuff that ended up on the edit floor, you would not believe. <laughs> that was the cleaned up version. Can't say that, Mark. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, just quickly, we're famous. Oh, I like I like that. Yeah, there's a, a, a Australian radio website called Radio Today. Uh, and, and they've done a little article on us. Oh, Very nice. nice. Were they, were they yeah. flattering? They were flattering. And, and also more flattering is the comments. <laughs> Good. I'll, I'll, I'll pop you one. A, a, guy, a friend of ours, a guy called Scott Muller, yep. who's uh, probably one of the, the, the better known programmers around the country or programming consultants these days, yep. has written, uh, this should be a great show. Robbo's, are looking, Robbo's looking a lot like Louis C.K. nowadays. So criteria number one of any great show has officially been nailed. <laughs> Good work. Thank you, Scott. Scott. Yeah, and also I see that uh, Ray Peters uh, has got his two bobs worth in too, which is always good. Great hearing this stuff is his comment. Yeah, which is unusual for Ray because I reckon on the expletive zometer, uh, he would give Mark Grau a run for his money, that's for sure. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, there you go. So we might uh, we might stick a, a link to the on our show notes so people can go and have a read about us and see your ugly mug as well. Oh, lovely. I must remember to get my hair done. Indeed. Yes. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear. All right, well, uh, that's about a show, eh? Yeah, and then next week, of course, we're back with uh, part two of Nick Tate. Yeah. Uh, it gets that. really, really interesting as uh, his uh, voiceover career as a trailer voice really gets moving. So check that out. The VO Radio Show is produced in the studios of Voodoo Sound. To polish your next audio production, check us out at voodoo-sound.com. Find professional voices simply all in one place. Realtimecasting.com, including me. And don't forget to catch next week's show because we've got this. Nick Tate. Ah, uh, yeah, that's part two. 